There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Addicted to Success podcast. I'm your host, Joel Brown, and I'm here today with Ricardo Bosi, who is the international author of The Five Pillars of Real Leadership, Greatness Away To. He's also the leader of the Australia One Party, and he's ex-SAS Special Forces Lieutenant Colonel. Now, Ricardo is one of the things that I would say I, I really... Uh, felt straight away when I saw his content and saw his message was that he's very unapologetically himself and he is for good cause. He's really stepping up as a leader, especially within Australia. And his message resonates throughout the world very deeply. And I love that he speaks from so much truth and so much conviction. He's very well versed uh, in his insights within worldly matters. And I couldn't help myself but to reach out to Ricardo and say, Ricardo, we need you on the podcast. So Ricardo, welcome to the Addicted to Success podcast. Thanks, Joel. Thanks for having me. It's an honor and a privilege. Yeah, yeah, man. So good to see another Aussie out there making things happen and moving the needle and enrolling incredible people into your vision for a better future. Uh, your book, The Five Pillars of Real Leadership, which I just brought up on the screen here, if you're watching the video interview, uh, I have had a really good skim through the book and you know, it's so interesting, man. I love the points that you share. You've got so many awesome people that you've quoted, but at the same time, I love that you've broken down great definitions of leadership. Now, if, to kick things off, what is a leader? Let's define that. Yeah, that's, a, that's the best question because a lot of people uh, are in the leadership game. They don't understand it. They can't define it. In fact, to, to tell the truth, it took me years to define it for myself because when I first started off as a young, uh, young officer, I was trained by some great people. They really were. But the examples and definitions of leadership they gave me were quite limited. And it wasn't until I actually wrote the book. And I wrote the book because I never found a book that satisfied my needs for both the art and the science of leadership. There's a lot to it. And most people will talk about a small segment and do it very well, but it didn't have a context. And so I, I, uh, I wrote the definition as, as, as fulsomely as I could, and then I contracted it to the point where it no longer had meaning, then I pulled it back out again to where it had exactly what I wanted to say. And it had to be concise, it had to be memorable. And a real leader is one who uses nothing but what they are to unite many to achieve good. And each word is extremely carefully selected. Uh, you, you can use uh, money, power, fame, sex, whatever, to get what you want, and you'll get the job done, but that's not leadership, that's something else. Uh, and so, to stand there and say, I am, and then to do what you want to do. You bring people together because you always need to bring people together. And there's a moral component. You've got to achieve good because uh, you can lead people down the wrong path. That's not leadership. That's something else. So just to repeat, a real leader uses nothing but what they are to unite many to achieve good. Mm, I love that. That's so deep and well thought out too. So I, let's go. let's go really deep. Stuff it. Let's go there. <laughs> I know I've, I've listened to a couple of your interviews and I know we can get like really deep. Um, I think that we live in a world right now where we've tried a lot of different systems, you know, and we've, we've gone the humanism route. We've gone the communism route. We've gone socialism, deism, all the isms, right? And the best that we have that's left with us right now is democracy. And even that is built off distrust. It's, it's based off, you know, whatever's popular, whoever makes it sound the fanciest is then voted in, but it's not, they're not held to a higher truth. Mm. So in this, within this is, and this is political, by the way, you know, it sounds political, but at the same time, it's happening to the masses too, with social media and the way that we do business. So many people now are going that route of like, well, I'll just make myself look big and influential and kind of fake it to make it is, is just oozing through our cultures now to the point where truth no longer needs to even exist within their frame of mind. How do we become influential in this world, whether it's to be a political leader, whether it's to be uh, someone of influence or, or a leader in a, in a social media space or in an industry without selling our soul out. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> That's as deep as the Mariana Trench. <laughs> <laughs> I told That's you we're good. 
suits, that suits me fine. Let's go straight to a couple of things and knock them on the head. Democracy is, uh, and the US is not a democracy. Uh, it's a constitutional republic. And what people need to understand about that is democracy is two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner. Now, that's, that's not really uh, sound because all of a sudden it's, it's the, the mob that rules. And the reason the founding fathers of the US chose a constitutional republic is profoundly wise. I mean, the, the, I don't think there was a point in history where a group of men so wise, so capable came together to create this magnificent experiment that is the United States. But they did that for a sound reason because, and here's a roundabout answer to your question about how we're, we're going off the rails and, and, and truth seems to be irrelevant now, is that it's, uh, a constitutional republic is based on rights, a right, a genuine right. I have a right that you may not impinge upon. And what is the source of that right? And people say, I have a right to this, I have a right to that. Mm. Well, yes and no. So let's dive deep. What is the source of your right? Well, I'm human. Well, that doesn't work because you know, in Australia, we've got 200 Muslims to our north in Indonesia. I've got no problems with that at all. But imagine if we brought 200 million Muslims into Australia and our little 25 million Australians, all of a sudden we have no rights because if you think democracy is the answer, you've got 200 Muslims saying we want Sharia. Yeah. So democracy doesn't work we have rights. The source of that right is this, and it's not my view, it's everyone's view, it's history. Either there is a creator that gave us our rights, or it's just opinion. And it's really as simple as that. Every argument on the planet comes down to the point of either you believe that you have a right, and it comes from a, a creator, or you don't have a right, because it's only opinion that will, uh, will win the argument. I have an opinion that this is important, and you have an opinion of something else. You have an opinion you can... Uh, you should smoke dope and I have an opinion that you don't. You have an opinion that you want to have sex with six-year-olds and I have an opinion you don't. So if you, mm -hmm. if you test any, any contentious issue, what it comes back to is this, and I'm not going to argue the existence of, a, of, a, of a, uh, an almighty God because it doesn't work. You either believe or you don't. So let's argue from, a, from a, uh, the perspective of there is no God. The start point for every discussion from now on is it's an opinion. So let's... The, let's the, uh, Facts speak for themselves. So you can raise any issue at all. As long as both sides acknowledge this is an opinion, now let's explore this opinion of mine and yours and we'll see who wins. So it's a, it's a, we've gone deeper than you probably intended, but that's at the heart of every discussion. I have a right to. Well, no, you don't. Mm. <laughs> you have an opinion. So let's argue, let's argue the case. I was given a question the other day about, um, I don't like your policy on marijuana. I said, that's fine. And, and uh, he said, look, I've been smoking for years and there's nothing wrong with me. And I said, well, that's great. But everyone is so carefully different that um, you can smoke dope all your life and have no impact. Others, it sends psychotic. So I said, let's let the science uh, you know, determine the, the solution. And then he, said, he was obviously grumbling a bit. And I said, OK, should everyone be allowed to use ice? And he went, oh, God, no. <laughs> I said, why? <laughs> why? You're either a complete anarchist or you're not. And so you, but when he finally got the point, it was a matter of opinion. Let the science decide. And then as a, as a society, we can agree amongst ourselves what we think is the best way to advance an individual and therefore the entire nation. Because when we get down to it, uh, self-government, this idea of self-government, and we're talking politics, is re relatively new in human history. Now, what worked in the United States... Uh, worked because they were essentially a moral people. They could govern themselves personally. Yeah. And because they could govern their, themselves individually, they were able to govern themselves nationally. But what we're losing is that capacity to uh, govern ourselves individually. As you said, anything goes. Anything goes. So if you can't govern your own uh, physicality, if you can't govern your own emotions, if you can't govern your own mentality, you can't um, govern your own psychology, you have no capacity to, as a group, govern anything. And so we sway backwards and forwards between totalitarianism, whether it's of the left or the right, because they're identical. Hitler and Stalin were the same, just both yeah. uh, tyrants, as is Xi Jinping. And we swing back left and right. And it takes time people, for people to realize that we need to come back, we need to come back, we need to come back until we get to this point where there is a right and wrong. There is objectively a right and wrong. Because if there isn't, it doesn't matter anymore. Do what you like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I look, this, this is, yeah, we're going deep. <laughs> and I love this because 
and this is a really special episode. Anyone that's listening to this has been listening to the Addicted to Success podcast for a long time. We share, you know, entrepreneurship advice and we share mindset advice. For the longest time, I always used to say, I, I will talk about anything. I don't want to talk about religion or politics. And as I've gotten older and, and really, you know, connected with more leaders in the world and had more life experience and seen the, the struggle of the human soul, there's no way anymore I can deny the fact that politics and religion has a huge play in how we experience life. And, and I like that we're going here. And, and, you know, I think there'll be some people in here be like, oh, this is a bit too much. That's cool. Maybe you're not ready for it yet, you know? And that was me by maybe like 10 years back, eight years back. But I like this, man, because this is like, I believe everything is touching everything. And so if we're not paying attention to one area, as much as it's, we can say, oh, well, I don't want to vote. You know, I don't want to go out there, whatever. I don't care. It still affects you. And if it doesn't affect you, it's going to affect your children and your children's children. It's a very important thing to pay attention to, whether you like it or not. I think a lot of people in this day and age have been so distracted. They've been so confused that they've just pushed responsibility to the side as if it doesn't impact their life. You're so, right, you know, because it's interesting. Let me just jump in there. Everything yeah. touches everything. And let me give you two absolutely opposite ends of the spectrum views on that. In quantum mechanics, there's a concept of entanglement. So whatever you do to an object, if you split that object in, part, in, 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 uh, in half and separate it by light years, Whatever you do to one will impact the other. You'll see the effect on the other. And this has been tested. In reality, they've, they've actually seen the result. Uh, now, let me give you another version of that. Whatever you do to these, the least of my brethren, you do unto me. Mm. In a very real sense, not in a theoretical, I don't believe in the flying spaghetti monster sense, but in a very real sense, whatever we do to one, we do to ourselves. So the most selfish thing you can do on the planet is be nice to people because on a quantum mechanical level, on a spiritual level, it's all the same stuff. And we have to understand that. Now, that doesn't mean we let people walk over the top of us because we're, we're in this third dimensional universe that has some basic rules to it. And you've got to apply those rules to survive. But at a, at a more profound level, absolutely. Everything affects everything and you can't wash your hands of it. It's called, um, in a book by M. Scott Peck, yep. uh, he described it as the fragmentation of conscience. And as you break down any process, you've got vertically into, invertedly particularly integrated companies and horizontally integrated companies, right? So horizontal, they will produce the same widget for multiple other organizations. The vertically integrated, they start from the farm, they grow the wool, they, uh, they process the wool, they knit the clothes and they sell it. That's the vertical integration. Now, when you're vertically integrated, you know the whole story and you know every part of it. The trouble is, as you break down any process into, into its constituent parts, conscience then is fragmented. What it means that is, look, I'm not a bad man. I'm just sealing these containers up and, and moving them to, the, uh, to the, uh, the shipping depot. Now, let me give you a really good example of that. Um, I use, a, when I'm consulting and we talk investments, I say, okay, um, I've got a company here, for example, and this is a, a true story, absolutely fact. They've got a great company. It's a pharmaceutical company, excellent international uh, clients, governments, uh, longstanding orders, Solid as a rock, great return on investment. Are you interested? And of course, everybody puts their hand up and says, yeah, absolutely. Then I say, okay, the name of this company is IG Farben. And they say, great, we don't much care. We're just going to buy shares and then we can trade those shares and then take the profit. Again, no problem. Then I say, okay, the, uh, one of their major products is a product called Zyklon B. Anybody got any strange feelings yet? And a few hands will sort of go up. And then I explain to them that Zyklon B was the gas that used to kill the Jews in the gas chambers. Oh. And IG Farben was actually had its major state, major shareholders, excuse me. IG Farben's uh, major shareholders were a number of US corporations. So all of a sudden, without realizing, without looking, you can actually be involved in quite nefarious activities without a, a care in the world, because what the system allows you to do is fragment your conscience and not take any notice of it. And let me give you another example, more, more uh, current. You see the ads on, uh, on YouTube, you know, I sell on Amazon. I buy my product for $3 a, a unit and I sell it for 55 and now I travel the world and have a great life. Yeah. Right. I love big profits. Don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of big profits. I really am because I've been broken. I've been rich and I know which I prefer. Yeah. Um, but what they may not know if they don't investigate correctly is that the widgets being made for $3.50 
uh, made uh, by slave uh, labor in China. And I don't mean poorly paid, I mean slaves. So this is difference, this is difficulty. Everything touches everything. It, it really does. And, and as sentient human beings with a conscience and a soul, we've got to look a little bit more carefully than just the, the metric of what's my ROI, because that's critical, don't get me wrong. As I said, I've been without money and that's not fun. You've got to make the money. But there's this fragmentation of conscience that if, if, if we let it slide, it's got nothing to do with me. It's got nothing to do with me. Well, yeah, it does. It does, because you're making money off the slavery of others or you know, fill in the blank, all the other problems. So once we lose that sense of right and wrong, once we lose that sense of connectivity with others, uh, you're heading down a bad path, whether you know it or not. And as I said, yeah. uh, you know, you've got to look into this. Yeah. And I think that some people don't want to, right? They want that ignorance because it, it makes them feel like they're pure at heart. And a, a great leader who I know that you have much respect for is he passed away not long ago is Ravi Zacharias. And he says that often the truth is surrounded by a bodyguard of lies. And, you know, we live in a world right now where whether you like it or not, we live in a world of duality right? Dark and light, hot and cold, good and evil. And it seems to be this thing of if we're just, we're asleep at the wheel, then more and more can come into, into the space. And it's kind of like that whole theory of the frog that's in the pot that slowly over time, that pot gets hotter and hotter till they don't, it doesn't know that it's actually burning and it's going to die. And we're in a space right now where more than ever we've needed to purge you know and i think that we're going through an interesting experience right now you know some people call it the great awakening some people say it may be the uh the great tribulation uh it could be this you know just this come and go thing over a phase of three months or six months there's so many different theories what are you experiencing right now what do you think is is actually happening and how can we best stand in our leadership in times like this yeah, what's happening, man? That's a that's a big question because, like like a lot of people, I'm I'm trying to glean as much as I can to understand it. It, it actually has a uh, in philosophy, it's called epistemology. How do you know what you know? <laughs> These days, you watch a thirty second YouTube video, and apparently you're full bottled. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like question what you question. That's that it. You've got it forever. <laughs> absolutely correct. But what do we do? And this is this is the key question. All you can do is decide who you are. And what you're going to do that's it just step up it's like it's like why i'm doing what i'm doing now now i can tell you it's far more profitable for me to travel the world and consult but we came back i had five years in the middle east and we came back um, about five years ago now and it was fantastic lifestyle we i mean we literally flew from from uh dubai and abu dhabi we flew to rome for for pizza we flew to vienna for a schnitzel we flew to cairo to see the all on a weekend because it's you can just do that now yeah. that's just that's, that's just brilliant. But we came back to Oz and we realized that um, in the time that we had left, we had, uh, the country had degraded so significantly. So I started looking into it. And then I found it hadn't degraded in the last five years, it had degraded over the last five decades. And as mm -hmm. I looked into it more deeply, I found out that what was going on is that we were subject to a, a deliberate strategy by very powerful global forces to, um, to damage us in every possible way. Now, all of us, comprise five parts. The first is physical. So they're going to damage us physically to make sure that we don't get fit and strong. We don't need right and exercise. We it's all sort, of, all sort of rubbish. Next, emotional. They affect our emotions by playing with them. So we lose, we lose the capacity to restrain our emotions. Apparently, if you feel it, then scream it out to the world, regardless of where our packs it. That's just ridiculous. You can't do it. Uh, and that's, that's taught us by movies as well. The next is the mental capacity. And so schools, the, the subjects being taught in schools are so dumbed down and so ridiculous. We have um, you know, gender ideology and masturbation for four-year-olds being in, in, you know, introduced to schools. Yeah. And I look at, um, and I'm an older dad and I've got a, a young family and I look at what they're doing and we've pulled our kids out of school and we homeschool simply because I know that what they're getting is inadequate, is insufficient and in, in many places just flat wrong. And then they hit us psychologically. They try to batter us psychologically so we're not psychologically strong enough to handle anything and then spirituality of course they damage they damage any uh connection that we have with the almighty whatever the almighty is for you and just on that and when people say i don't want to talk religion okay well 
in, in Australia, and I'm sure the numbers are even more powerful in the US because I have great admiration for the, uh, the, religious, the strength of the religious foundations of the United States, but in Australia, a lot of people say, oh, we're not a religious country. Well, we are in fact, and also in our foundations. And let me give you the example, the proof. Over 51% are Christians, end of story. Over 70% are people of faith. So we've got seven out of 10 believe in an almighty God. Then you've got about, I don't know, 10, 15%, maybe 20, depending on who does the research, of people who are just not sure. And that's fine too. And then somewhere between seven and 10%, you've got the rabid atheists that will spend an entire lifetime telling us we're fools. So on one level, to speak about religion is absolutely sound. If you're talking from a business perspective, there's 51% of the marketplace already. Now, if you want to yeah. expand about Christianity and talk faith, you now got 70% of the marketplace, but nobody wants to touch it because they need to destroy that relationship with God, these global forces. Because the moment they can pull you from your God, forget it. The rest is, the rest is done. It's, mm. it's, it's all finished. And so they are. You're right. There is, a, there is light and dark. There is right and wrong. And we need to stand up. So what do we do? Just to repeat the answer to your question, what do we do as leaders? Decide who we are and what we're going to do with this gift called life and start doing it. As we did, came back from overseas, put everything else to the side. And now um, I've told my wife, this is going to cost us everything. And she said, no problem, let's go. She's solid. I like, love her a lot. And so we've been doing that. We've been putting that to our, our goal is very simple. Our mission is to save Australia. Yeah, I love that. Hey, I could be talking to the next prime minister. <laughs> Who knows, man? And the thing that I like about you too, Ricardo, is the fact that it's not about that for you. You know, we had a conversation before. It's more about you coming in with an incredible team of people that also believe that it is about right and wrong and that you get to make Australia a place where it's grounded in good morals again, you know? And, and I, I think this is what it is. It's like, that little one degree off that keeps going, it, it, it's very separated over a long period of time. And I was talking about this with my mate, John Templeton before, who we've had on this podcast. And, you know, I said to him, I'm 33 years old, you know, and for me, I haven't lived in times of epic wars, you know, horrific wars. And if you look throughout history, this is one of the most peaceful times, whether you believe it or not, we're very blessed very, very blessed. And it's, it's almost like this thing where if there's enough peace over time and people are not grateful for that peace and don't have that center point, you know, that connection with a higher power, that relationship with the creator, then you lose your moral compass. And it almost becomes this thing where you start nitpicking at all these things you don't like. And we, we live in a generation, I can say being a 33 year old, we have these like wokeivists, they call them woke activists, you know, that are screaming social justice warriors. And I believe we should stand up for our truth. It's just, you don't want to get to a point where you've, you've lost your direction and your eyesight on what this is all about and zooming out and looking at the big picture. Because if we were living in times of world wars, if it was world war three, everyone would shut up, you know, and we get to work and we band together. And I think that we, we just have to remind ourselves each and every day of how grateful we should be and could be that we live in a time like this. And then we get to, you know, have all the access we can through internet and everything else. And we have incredible leaders like you to, to shine light on these topics. And I think people just need to wake up. Yeah. And the, we are at war. That's the problem. It's just not one that we have experienced before. I mean, that's my profession. So I look at life, through a certain prism like a doctor does or an engineer does or an artist does. We all, we are trained to see the world through our prism. And we've been at war for decades, five, six, seven decades, um, quite specifically. In a previous interview, um, it was put to me that uh, giving our sovereignty to the UN is a good thing because what that does is prevented war. And I said to the, I said to the interviewer, well, we have been at war except we just haven't been told and we don't have the, we haven't had the ability to, to, to defend ourselves either in word or with a rifle. And I'm comfortable doing both, but they're not, uh, we have been at war. We have been attacked. Uh, it's just been very subtle and it's been, it's been driven by global forces, but facilitated by corrupt politicians. And um, my goodness me, if we are at a point in this country and where the globe is, where, and let me pick a very controversial subject because I get a lot of pushback and that's where I like to go best. 
Because I've got a lot of advice. Don't talk about this. Don't talk about that. You'll just alienate. Go there. I'm sorry. Let's go there. <laughs> well, people, are scared, people are scared to call the UN the, the toothless tiger. Like that's essentially what it is. It's just like this quiet, you know, infiltration. Yeah. But let's talk about something very controversial like abortion. Now, I'm not talking about the night after a girl has a, a drunken fling by mistake and wants to make sure that nothing comes of it and she takes a morning after pill. I'm not talking about that. I have a personal view, but that's not the point. Um, I'm talking about full-term abortion on demand, which is now legal in four states in Australia. It's uh, some of the most draconian abortion laws on the planet. Um, Tasmania, Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland. It's being pushed through. And I explain this to people and they are afraid to speak. But it doesn't matter what our GDP is if we're killing babies and selling their body parts, which is what's going on. Oh my and gosh. it confronts people when I say that and they say, please dial it back a bit, please dial it back a bit. And I say, really? Okay, imagine you're sitting in front of Auschwitz and you're watching kids being shoved into the gas chambers and then burnt. You sit there quietly and, and say, excuse me, I have a, a complaint to make or do you storm through and say, stop this now? This is the grossest of, of, of crimes that we can possibly imagine. It's right up there. And we're not allowed to talk about it. We're not allowed to ex expose it. And that's what they're terrified of. They know. By they, I mean the globalist forces. They have taught us to censor ourselves. And they have this air of invincibility. But I can tell you this, there's a lot more of us than them. And uh, the key to successfully taking back this country and any country, and you alluded to it earlier, it's about the people. It's not about running a party like a dictator, because if you can't run your party democratically, how the hell can you run a country democratically? You can't. Mm. So that's the whole point. We have to empower people. And this is the whole purpose of my book. And the, uh, the leadership book, as I said, I wrote it because I couldn't find one book that covered both the science and the art of leadership. But it applies, the lessons apply for a chief executive of a, of a, of a global corporation to a single parent working two and a half jobs and trying to raise decent kids. The lessons are identical because your kids need you to be the best possible leader there is. No excuse. And so this is a decades long process that we've embarked upon. I won't see the end of my work done. I understand that. But this is not about building a party to run the country. This is the whole purpose of, of uh, Australia One, the political party, is to help empower the entire population to be able to stand up and govern themselves so they are able to govern themselves, if that makes sense, given our earlier discussion. That's the point. In, uh, in the military, let me explain how that works. That might be confusing to people. Why are you in politics? A woman rang me up today. She said, don't you want votes? I said, no. And it shocked her. I don't want votes. I'm trying to save the country. Politics is just one way of doing it. And so when, when you set an intention in the military, it comprises three parts, purpose, method, end state. The purpose is what you want to do. The end state is how you know you've succeeded. That's the metrics. That's vital. Anybody in business knows that. Unless you've got targets, unless you've got metrics, you're not in business, you're in a hobby that happens to make money or not. Purpose, method, end state. So in my case, um, purpose is to save Australia. The end state is Australia is a sovereign, self-reliant, Judeo-Christian Western democracy, which is economically powerful, militarily intimidating, politically free, socially cohesive, and culturally vibrant. Now, that's, there's an end state. Now, that sounds like a bloody good country to me. Now, the <laughs> method. Now, method. Politics is only one method, but I have several other methods which are running in parallel with each other, which achieve the same objective. So when people say, oh, you're just a politician, <laughs> no, I'm not, not at all. I just happen to be setting up a party, which will be a mechanism or a, a vehicle by which Australians can start taking charge of their own lives. And people say to me, Rick, what's the next step? And I say, easy, get into your electorate and start serving your, the people in your electorate, start serving them. And they look at me quizzically and I say, Here's how it's got to work. When it comes to voting time, they don't vote for you because you've got a big Australia one next to your name. They vote for you because you're the person that ran the sausage sizzle, that raised money to buy the swing set for the kids in the cancer ward. So when they come to vote, they're voting for you personally, not for a brand. Don't vote for the brand. Vote for the man, vote for the woman. That's where it lies. And so I tell them, that's what you've got to do. Go serve your community and then you'll be worthy of their vote. Um, I've had people ring me up and you know, these are, politics attracts some very strange creatures. And they ring me up and say, look, I've got $50,000, $100,000. I'll throw it into your kitty. I'd like a number one spot on your Senate ticket, please. And I smile and say, look, thanks for that. Best you can do is go serve your community. And when it comes time to select a candidate, 
if you've served them well enough, they will vote for you. And then I'll put an Australia One label next to your name. And that's the way we have to do it. Now, this is going to take a long time, but we're okay with it. A dictatorship's quicker, but too many people die. So, <laughs> so we want yeah. to make sure we get, we get the right people uh, responding to the people that they serve. Uh, and they have, to, they have to respond 24-7, 365. And this, you've got to be smart about this. You've got to put mechanisms in place. For example, the way we're going to do it, and it's in the Constitution, which will be out soon enough, uh, we're going to have recall elections. Now, recall elections are common in the US, but they're not so common here in Australia. And what we're going to do is this. If they vote for a branch president or an elected president or a candidate, and all of a sudden the candidate starts going off track, let's say, they just have a recall. 10% want you back, so you've got to recontest your seat. So instead of being politicians being responsive every three years to the electorate, which is what happens, we know that, you know, they make promises, they get in, nothing happens for three years, and three years later they say, look, you know, we'll try again. No. Recall elections for everybody. If you don't answer your electorate's phone calls 24-7, 365, you get punted. And all of a sudden, instead of having members of parliament or senators, or in the American uh, context, members of Congress and senators who are doing deals in Washington, or in our case in Canberra, they have to respond. They represent the actual people they're representing. And so we start to get this responsibility. I'm responsible for my electorate. And if we can win enough electorates, we're going to win government. And if we win government, we can start turning this around. There you go. This is the thing. If you want to see a true change, you've got to try something different. And, you know, I've seen it over and over again with entrepreneurs. They just keep going and beating at the, the same drum with the same sound and going, why am I not making different music. <laughs> Why is no one hearing this? It's, they've been hearing it for too long. They've become deaf to it. There's got to be a new way to do it. And you're right. Even in a business, um, uh, Ricardo Semla from um, South America, he, uh, he was the first real champion of empowering his staff. And that's the way we do it in Australia One. Um, we're learning as we go. I allow uh, genuine, innocent errors. I don't allow too many repetitions of those errors. Um, but you've got to, we have to train these people to be able to become more than they ever were before. And, it's, and, and you know, let's dive down another, another sort of Mariana Trench here. You know, people wonder how, they look at my CV and they go, well, that's amazing, how did you live that life? It's not like I planned it, I didn't. I, I, I like everybody else, is in the process of becoming what God created me to be. Um, you know, I'm very grateful for that, every minute of that. But we all start, with an agenda, we all start with abilities. We we are blessed with um, shortcomings because that shortcoming is exactly what we're supposed to learn. But we, our job is to become what we were created to be, and we're all created to be something. There's a theory that um, the kids are born as a what they call in Latin tabula rasa, which is a blank slate. And there's the famous saying, "Give me the boy till he is seven, I'll give you the man." Well, up to a point, yeah. Socrates was a smart guy, and he was about right. But what, uh, what the, the pre-Christian thinkers lacked was Christ. <laughs> and this simple concept that each individual life is unique and of infinite worth. If you think of the most loathsome person on the planet, that person's soul is worth more than the entire Egyptian dynasty. Because it will pass. The human soul lasts forever. It's, it, it's infinite. It never stops. And everything that we do ripples throughout eternity or infinity. Mm -hmm. And so when we understand that, we realize, okay, I'm becoming something else. I've got to become more than I was. That's the process. How do you do that? Well, every problem you've got, and uh, there's a good way to look at it. If I had chosen this exact set of circumstances to teach me a lesson, what would it be? Now, that's not new, but it's very powerful. Because we all, it's well, humans, we complain. You know, something goes wrong, we blame somebody else, and we swear and carry on. But once again, it's one of five challenges we're dealing with. It's either physical, emotional, mental, psychological, or spiritual. That's it. They're the metrics. Just look at where am I struggling here, you know, and fix it. Um, so become what we're supposed to become, knowing that we are so unique and different to everybody else. So with your entrepreneurs, they can mirror the behavior of other successful people. Absolutely. That's, that's a smart thing to do. In fact, we're biologically predisposed to do that. There comes a time when we have to step out on our own, and this is where the leader is different to everybody else. 
the leader steps out and says, I must, I've tried everything that we that guaranteed to work, but it didn't. Then I tried everything that I thought might work and it didn't. Now I've got to try something I have no idea whether it's going to work or not. Now you enter a whole new realm. You cross this invisible line and the world steps aside. And it is such an empowering moment to stand up and say, I am. And, and that mm. act of stepping outside, uh, you can't go back. You just can't. It's, it's a brilliant place to be. And I look at people on the other side of that line, come over, there's plenty of room. And some <laughs> do, and, and they smile at me and they say, thank you so much, because they are now becoming what they were created to be. And everyone is so different. We really are. It's, yeah. it's, it's great fun. Proof as a creator, man. We're not just dancing with our DNA. We were created for a reason. I, I believe it. our life has meaning. You know, it's, that's a beautiful part of it always. And every day we get to choose where we live emotionally. We get to choose the decisions that we make. I had Tony Robbins on the podcast a little while back and we're talking about living a better quality of life. He said, Joel, to have a better quality of life, we need to start making better quality decisions. But how do you do that? It has to come from wisdom, right? Guidance and wisdom. And, and it's being willing to make mistakes, to correct yourself along the way, putting yourself out there, which is, you know, the, the, the epitome of a leader is, is essentially courage, you know, courage and contribution. And yeah, it was, it was really cool to have that conversation and to hear you as well speaking in this space. It just shows that there's so much available to us and a lot of it starts with responsibility. And I think a lot of people have just gotten really lazy with responsibility. Dr. Jordan Peterson talks about this whole spending too much time in reward and not enough time in responsibility. And I think that a lot of people are possessed by an idea they haven't practiced integration and integration is where you start to see the results mm. you mentioned courage um and i'm glad you did because the great leadership real leadership demands uh four virtues and the first is courage and people resile at that and they think no 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 it's it's, it's got to be wisdom and i say no wisdom is second the third is faith faith in yourself faith to take action and the fourth is love so they're the four virtues of, of real leadership, courage, wisdom, faith, love, but it's in that order because courage, as um, Aristotle said, guarantees all the others. Because if you haven't got courage, you can be the smartest guy on the planet. If you haven't got the, if you haven't got the, uh, the courage to step forward, to step away from the crowd, then it doesn't matter whether what you know, it'll never get out there. Courage. <clears throat> now, physical courage is a component of that. Now, I played a lot of com competitive sport. Uh, rugby league, rugby union, and soccer. And leagues are the game is the most brutal game I played. It's it's not uncommon. It's not unlike uh, American football, except instead of patting <laughs> yourselves up, we just go head to head, <laughs> and there's no breaks. <laughs> it's just it's brutal. But I loved it because every uh, being a, one of the bigger guys on the team, my job was to take the ball and just run forward and get as many yards yards as I could. So I'd get the ball. I had three or four guys hanging off me and just drag forward. That physical confrontation with physicality is important because it builds a psychological uh, robustness. I can do this, it will hurt, but I'll be okay. The courage is first, it really is. And, and people have got to understand that. There's physical courage, emotional courage, psychological courage, spiritual courage. And at every stage, as, as I've advanced up this ladder from, from a, a callow youth, as we all started, we all start young and silly, but as I've advanced up this ladder, uh, you'll get to a new level and things, things are okay, but then you need that courage to step to the next level and courage to step. So this constant pattern repeats itself. Courage, wisdom, faith, love. Courage, wisdom, faith, love. Just keep going, just keep going. But courage is key. Without the courage, no good. But then you obviously mm -hmm. got the wisdom to make sure you <laughs> don't do dumb stuff over and over and over again, as you quite rightly said. Amen to that. Amen to that. So, Ricardo, uh, right now in the world, just to kind of loop it back around, we're kind of weaving in and out here. Uh, and, and I like the way you're tying it together right now. There's a lot happening, especially in the online space. There's a lot of, uh, suppressing of freedom of speech. Uh, there is the news and media lying through their teeth. You know, we saw it the other day with channel seven news saying that hospitals are reaching breaking point, And then you see that they've used old footage from Italy uh, to, to scare people into fear, to think that, you know, the Corona is taking over the world. Um, and, and we then, you know, get this news about all this Jeffrey Epstein and sex trafficking and things happening to children. And, and, you know, I've seen it on social media. I shared a few things that were very concerning that had very good evidence behind it. 
And I had my followers reach out to me like, Joel, I can't believe this. It's almost like the truth has come out and it's so heavy for some people to handle. And it's happened on so many levels lately. This whole purging that's happening right now is just so much being revealed. And, and the common question I get asked is like, well, what can I do about it? Like, I feel just like really frustrated and I'm shocked. What do I do about it? Is it time now to sit and observe? Is it time to go in and get into your spiritual connection? Is it time to really reevaluate your vision for the future to see how you want to start showing up? Is it time to just go out on the streets and speak out? Like, what, what is it? What do you believe it is in order to really facilitate change yeah, in a positive it, direction? It depends on what your end state is, and you've got to define that end state uh, in, in, uh, in detail. But it's all of the things you mentioned, and I get asked that a lot. What are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to protest at Parliament House? And uh, No, not yet, because you, you hit the biggest problem. People don't want to know, and when you do tell them, they'll turn away, because it is too horrific. It is genuinely horrific. Um, I was explaining. Why, why do you think that is? Does it is it like a cog, does it challenge their cognitive bias or is it a cognitive dissonance or what is it? It's I've seen cognitive dissonance in action. It's describing an abortion procedure to somebody who said, "Oh, I'm a bit of a pinko," and I said, "Well, your favorite politician is a big fan of this," and her head tilted. <laughs> and then she just and then she just said, "Oh, well, you know, well, anyway, well, that's it," and she just refused to accept it. Um, we have been as a people softened to the point where we are incapable of better. That's the problem. Um, mm -hmm. Let me give you a physical analogy. Uh, if you do weights, that resistance, that heaviness makes the muscle stronger. It also makes the bones denser. So the bones are more capable of withstanding shock. Um, if you don't use weights, if you don't uh, stress your bones, they get fragile and break. You hear the story about the little old lady that fell down and broke her hip. No, what happened was the hip broke and she fell down because the bones are no longer dense enough to carry the weight because it's not being used. I'm not having a shot at little old ladies. They shouldn't be out there bench pressing 500 pounds. <laughs> I'd be pretty impressed if that was going on. <laughs> but the point is this, and work in its broadest sense is necessary for health, physical, emotional, mental, psychological and spiritual health work that effort is is critical to it you can't sit back and do nothing and be healthy on any on any level and we have intentionally as i said at the beginning we have been intentionally weakened on every metric and there's a there's a, there's a very very exquisitely planned and executed uh, strategy by communists and globalists and a few others to do that and so yes we are at a point now where we can't say to people here is the truth because they they will not listen and i think um, Trump and Q have come out and said, uh, you can't tell people. Sometimes they have to see for themselves and they have to see the horror of what's going on. Yeah. And as gruesome as that is, they need to face the truth because you can't be a part-time adult. Either you're an adult or you're not. Either you can face the truth or you can't. Either you can take responsibility or you can't. But now we have this extended adolescence and sort of, I think it, by the time you hit 80, they'll cut you some slack and expect you to be an adult. When I was a kid, and you know, I've been on the planet 60 years, so you know, the world in which I grew up was fundamentally different to this one. Mm. Um, we were required to take responsibility. We were taught to take responsibility. And I'll tell you a story because it's, it's an insight into what the prevailing mindset was back in 1968. And this is a year before Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. Um, and it's a story that happened to me, and that's why I use it, because I know this is real. It's not just one of those stories that professional public speakers use. Uh, we were sitting, we were standing in uh, the school assembly before school started, and there was a guy in front of me, an American guy called Joe Smotherman. Joe, how are you? I hope you're okay. Anyway, Joe had the wrong school jacket on that day. Obviously, something had happened, so mum and dad just gave him another jacket, roughly the same color, but the wrong one, um, to keep him warm, because it was winter. Anyway, I was teasing him, like, idiot eight-year-olds do about wearing the wrong jacket. And Joe retaliated, he swung around and, and sort of told me to, to bite my tongue. Anyway, Mother Superior, because we were being taught by the Sisters of Mercy, Mother Superior spotted Joe and thought he was the troublemaker and pointed a finger and said, see me after this. And so we went to our class and the nun was there with her strap and she pulled Joe out the front and she was gonna strap Joe. That was the old corporal punishment days. And I knew that what was about to happen was 
grossly wrong. And I also knew because I had been taught by good parents and the nuns and the priests what was right and wrong. So she's lifted her arm up and she's about to strap this guy with a, st a, leather, a leather strap. And it wasn't like thin like a belt. This was like a, a rod. Might as well have been a cane. Whew. And I put my hand up and said, excuse me, sister. And it was Sister Mary Joseph. And, and she said, yes, what do you want? I said, it wasn't Joe's fault. That was my fault. I teased him. And she looked at Joe and asked him, is that correct? And Joe said, yes. And so she said, okay, Joe, you sit down. Rick, come out here. And so I came out the front and she strapped me instead. And I didn't mind because that's what should have happened. Now, if an eight-year-old can know the difference between right and wrong, if an eight-year-old can take responsibility for his actions, there's no excuse for anybody above the age of eight to say, oh, well, you know, you know cut me some slack. No. But unfortunately, this concept of right and wrong has been so intentionally destroyed within the hearts and souls of humans all around the planet that they no longer know what's right and wrong. They look shocked and they can't even process anymore. How do I yeah. respond to this situation? Because they just don't know. And so it's tough. You know, we, this is the whole process. This is a war. This is a war and you can't even see the enemy because the enemy is your teacher. The enemy is the principal. The enemy is the politician. The enemy is the secretary of the Department of Education. The enemy is everybody but you and your mum and your dad and your family. Because they're yeah. the only ones looking after you. Everybody else is sold out. Yeah. Man, and it's like just hearing this really sums up a lot of what I've experienced throughout my life and, and really just being head to head with it. You know, like I think a lot, some people just give in and go, okay, that's just how it is. For whatever reason, I've just hated injustice. For me, I got actually, I think I know what it is. I got severely bullied throughout high school and they were going around picking on all the other kids. And I, one day I just went, you know what? I've had enough. And I stood up to him. I learned martial arts. I felt pretty confident in my self-defense. And I got severely beaten, but I, I remember just hitting this fork in the road and going, I'm either going to be the victim or the victor. And I went on to be the victor. And I think some of it was some overcompensationary success. Like you didn't beat me. <laughs> that was my next chapter to work through that in itself. But it surprises me how many people just roll over and take it and how many people are scared to tell the truth, you know? And, and this is one of the things that Jordan Peterson talks about so much that it's so important to tell the truth. And when I started getting in the practice of telling the truth, and I mean, on a level where, you know, being in a relationship with someone and saying something, which could mean that if I shared this, they could walk out the door and never talk to me again. You know, something that I have experienced in my past or speaking truth from a sense of standing on stage in front of thousands and sharing a vulnerable story that I could easily be judged. But knowing that after it happened, like how many people were like, oh my gosh, I've experienced that too. I think we forget that we're human. We're putting on this huge act to try and be something. And it's, it's this, this system that we're part of now. Some people call it the matrix or whatever you may call it, but it's like this game that's being played. And sometimes we don't even know that we're playing it. Do you mm. notice that within yourself too? Like you oh, got a absolutely. question, am I playing the game or am I playing my own game? That's, that's the last chapter of the book. It's, 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 um, is the first chapter zero is, uh, trust the foundation. Okay. Chapter one is then your character. Chapter mm. two is your capability. Chapter three is your invention. Chapter four is empowerment and chapter five. And this is, this is, it, it speaks exactly to what you were talking about. That is you. Chapter five is you, who are you? And then I, I go through in, uh, in simple steps initially to, to break it down into what, what comprises this character that you've been building up over years. But the more profound message comes at the end. And we build up a reputation. We build up this image of who we are, who we want to be. And it can be a, a business success, a military success, a political success, uh, an artistic success. It makes no difference. But we are something and we have a reputation. And then we get the opportunity to really test ourselves. Um, and the biblical source for this is quite good. And I quote it as, uh, greater love hath no man that this man gives up his life for his friend. Now, if you're willing to give up your life for your friend, that's a, that's a big deal. But, but most of us aren't actually confronted with 
life and death situations every day where you'll take the hit. You know, I'll go over the top, sir, leave Jacko behind. No, but we are because all of us have a reputation. We have a cash flow. We have a business. We have a life that we know that in a second would be destroyed if we spoke our truth. Now, what keeps me going? Well, that's easy. All I have to do is think of the kids. And what sort of man am I? What sort of leader am I if I am unwilling to risk my reputation and not speak up in defense of children? I may, it doesn't matter what reputation I've got. Because when this is over, I'll have to, I'll have to meet my maker. <laughs> yeah. Even yeah. if I don't believe in a God, and even if I don't believe I'm going to meet my maker and have to account for myself, what sort of man am I if I sit here and celebrate a 13% increase on my ROI while I know that the people making my products are slaves. I'm not. I'm no example to anybody. And it's so it's really simple. We have to be capable of. This is the greatest level of leadership you can find. You risk all, everything. Public humiliation, poverty, ridicule, the lot for the truth. And when you cross that bridge, nothing will ever set you back ever again it is the great place to be and it takes a while to get there and you'll you'll speak out you'll speak out and eventually if your sense of right and wrong is strong enough whether you believe in a god or not's not 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 the point when you finally risk everything for the truth you become fearless utterly fearless and you step forward and the world steps aside for a man or woman who knows where they're going and that's the trick. Be willing to give that up. C.S. Lewis wrote about it. He called it a, a counterfeit life. This, 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 this poor imitation of the life that God created for us. And we live this pretend life. And every day we get a chance to speak the truth. Not my truth or your truth. The truth. Yeah. And say, this is wrong. <laughs> and it's We're, great. Once you cross that line, my goodness me, you have no idea. You are bulletproof. You're 10 foot tall. Nobody can touch you. You're good. And it's the one thing I can guarantee you, it's the one thing that'll keep you going when everything else is telling you to stop. You're tired. The demands are too great. You haven't slept. You haven't got money to pay the rent. All that stuff fades into insignificance because now you are fearless. Now you are willing to speak, think, speak, and do the things that must be done because it's right. Yeah, fearless in faith. I remember this George Orwell quote, it says the further a society drifts away from the truth, the more it hates those that speak it. And this is what it is. We're in this space right now in this postmodern modernistic world. It's, it's exactly that. And, and, you know, take it back to 2000 years ago with Jesus, when he's crawling along the ground with this cross on his back, whether you believe in Christ or not, he is a man that actually existed. There's historical proof. He was a man. There was a man called Jesus and he died on a cross. And, and rose again and you know he's crawling along the ground with his ribs showing from being whipped dripping in blood with this crown of thorns upon his head and a cross on his back and he says father please forgive them for they do not know and then at the end when he's hanging on the cross he says it is finished like his mindset of just holding the whole time he's on this mission for truth to to you know in in the way that he showed up in that whether you believe in christ or not it's just that in itself this this young carpenter boy that enrolled and recruited some of the most unlikely people on earth, like a, you know, a tax man and fisherman to come on, on this mission with him. And at 33 and a half years old, you know, dies on the cross. And today there's over 2 billion people worldwide that worship him. It's like that. No one's ever done that in history. No one. No matter who you say this person or that, no, no one's ever done that. And that mission to die for even the word, passion and i love like in your book you quite often talk about this this idea of living through your purpose right and really driving at home through what is truth and and really having that courage the word passion the latin root word of the word passion means to suffer for the passion of the christ the suffering of the christ right that yeah. that to me is just like it blows my mind and and you got to ask yourself what am i willing to suffer for not in a morbid way but like, what is it that I'm willing to really, because like in that feeling of suffering, you also become alive in it too. It reminds you that you're actually here and breathing. 
Exactly right. And it's, um, there's two things on that. The first one is, I love your take. Even if Christ wasn't God, just put that to one side and just say he's just a man. Now, I, I love saying this to people. Name one human on this planet who has done more to advance civilization than the carpenter's son. You know, take your time. There's nobody else. He's worth studying just as a man, just as a human. That's worthy of study. And then eventually they drift to other, other areas. But there's a good question my, in relation to this that my son asked me once when he was young. He said, Dad, why do you do what you do? And, you know, I thought about it. I thought, well, I spent 24 years in the army and it's, it's a tough, you know, dangerous job. And then I thought about it. And uh, I looked at the mottos of some of the regiments that I've served in. And the Royal Australian Regiment, the motto was duty first. That's duty is a good thing to, to, to teach children. You've got to do it whether you like it or not. It's your duty. You just got to do it. But that doesn't tell me why. And then I served with the Specialist Service Regiment. And that was who dares wins. And that's fantastic. And that tells me what sort of man I have to be. What sort of what I've got to bring to the table. But it doesn't tell me why. And then... Um, I served with the 1st Commando Regiment, strike swiftly. Again, tells me how to do my job and not why. And the why is everything, because if the why is clear, the how and the when and the where is simple. And so I thought about it, and then I started to reflect on my life. And you start to pick up patterns uh, to your life. And it starts at, in, in, in school, and you start to see what sort of kid you were in, in high school and then later on. And I saw a motto once. And it, it just rung true and it just encapsulated in four words exactly why I do what I do. And that's why I never have to ask what I'm going to do next. And it's so others may live. And that's my why. So I'm the guy that steps between two people that are fighting, even though this is, I was in about, um, in the American parlance, about eighth grade. And there are two 10th graders fighting in the, in the schoolyard. And these guys are giants compared to me. And I just walk between them. And I grabbed their shirts and separated them. Now, why? <laughs> so others may live. Uh, whenever I see an innocent uh, being threatened by danger, I'm just compelled to stand between the two. And that's what this Australia One Party is all about. Australia's in danger. The world's in danger. You know, Trump's doing a, a bang-up job in the US. We've got to do a job here in Australia. We've got to help Australians protect themselves because we're under threat. The whole world's under threat. And yeah. we have to stand between the innocent and, and danger in order that they may live. So that why yeah. is so important. Yeah, man, there's a difference between existing and living as well, you know, because I think a lot of people just exist in life. They don't actually live for something and it becomes a little bit more evident. I, I see, and I notice I don't have kids. I know you have, you have uh, children, so you know what it would be like, but when you start having that more of that, why like, Oh, now I've got someone to provide for. And, I, and now I'm actually, now I'm more of a leader than I've ever needed to be in order to do this. And I think that we've got to really dial in and go, what am I here for? What am I here to do? What's my why? They say, find a why that makes you cry. I like mm. that. It's got to be deep and meaningful to give our life that deep and meaningful experience. I would love to see your party or you yourself run as prime minister in Australia. I think that Australia needs this leadership. Uh, and I think the world also needs to see more examples of this because I think it's quite easy to just roll over. And, and I think that a lot of people don't use critical thinking with it's, it's almost like that's been suppressed through, like you're saying, it's almost like a brainwashing that's happened over a long period of time to the point where it's almost like you're a weirdo or a lunatic. If you use critical thinking, <laughs> right. It's, it's judged. It's like, no, 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 don't be too smart. Don't be too smart. Don't challenge the system. It's there you know, because we've developed that way. It's like, well, why? You know, and a lot of people don't ask that question. Yeah. Thinking, it, the moment you said that, you're, you, you gave me a flashback to 1977 when I was doing my final year at school. And I've just finished, we're in the last year of 13 years of Catholic education, as you can imagine, all right? And now just for the people who don't understand Catholics, uh, my parents are Italian, so we were raised with Italian Catholicism, which is pretty relaxed. The priest is there, but he's sort of like, hey, you talk to him if you want to, but it's more a personal relationship with God. And the rules and regulations, you can sort of take or leave them. But we were taught by Irish Catholics, and they're, <laughs> they're hard people. Anyway, so I'm in my last year after 13 years of Catholic education, and we submitted, I submitted an essay to the teacher, and it came back with a comment on top, uh, 
this is not very good. It contains too many value judgments. And this is 77, and the concept of value judgment was just being introduced. They feed lines to us that the, the, uh, the imbeciles in the mainstream media just parrot without thought, no critical thinking, they don't actually think about it. Now, you can't have a value judgment because everything is as good as everything else. It's all opinion. I thought to myself, you've got to be kidding me. After 13 years of Catholic education where everything is values based, <laughs> to now be told you can't make a value judgment. Well, I'm sorry, Felicia, I can make a value judgment and I will continue to do so until everybody else catches up and realizes, you know what? There are some things that are right and some things are just wrong. But yeah. you have to think about it. You've got to think, you've got to work it out for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, if you're not careful, you end up in a very tizzy wizzy world with a lot of confusion, right? And I've noticed, you know, I study theology and what I'm noticing, even within the papacy, they're, they're starting to ooze in this liberal theology, which is that, you know, Christ never came here to save everyone. He was here just to save the poor. And then, so that then oozes into all these other protests that are going about that this is what it's really about. And it distorts the message. And I think, it's like this Chinese whispers game that, that gets played throughout history. And we've got to do our due diligence, you know, to get that grounding. That's why it's so important to have a relationship and a connection with that, that, uh, you know, God creator, your spiritual connection to understand like, wait a minute, these were put here for a reason. Like these morals, these values are here for a reason, you know? And I think uh, we're in this post-modernistic world, it's, it's like everyone's trying to take it down and tear it down. And I remember having this conversation with one of my friends that was very much into relativism. It's like, well, it's that because I think it's that. And, and it's that to you because you think it's that. And I said, well, then why are we even talking about this then? Because we'll just never win in this conversation. <laughs> and he's like, huh. And, and I think what we must do in order to really have a deeper, meaningful connection with our beliefs is to choose it for ourselves, to know that we've actually done the due diligence to choose it for ourselves, and, and I know in the Bible, it says children of God. It doesn't say grandchildren of God. It's not that I would believe it because my parents did or my grandparents did. It's I had to choose that relationship for myself. And I, I'm challenging anyone right now to think about like, what have you chosen and what's been adopted? Hmm. Have That's you had this exactly. experience too? Yes, you've got, a, you've got an experience. You've got a test. And there's an old saying by um, Mark Twain, and I won't get the words right, it's in the book, but basically the self-made man is the result of unskilled labor. It's a short version. You've <laughs> got to study, you've got to learn. Um, you've got to see the patterns of history, why things went right, why when things went wrong, and not just apply a formula for today. Let me give you a business example. Uh, the fans of Milton Friedman, and I'm a big fan of Milton Friedman, the economist, uh, very keen on a laissez-faire approach to liberate creative talents of the people. And I'm a big fan of, I have a massive libertarian streak. Get off the people's back and let them get on with their lives. Um, but the problem with that is it was predicated on a Judeo-Christian philosophy. So when you've got a, a nation that knows right and wrong, that understands the Ten Commandments, which is based on thousands of years of... Um, of lessons and, and patterns and failures and successes, then you can say to people, be free and do what you like. But the moment you rip that foundation away from them, and they no longer have this right and wrong, then let's say fear is just the law of the jungle, it's anarchy, and we're getting it now. And so we are learning, the, the world is learning that until we come back to a, found, a moral foundation, then all the other peripheral issues will lead to nothing but destruction and fear. It's got to come back to that, that, moral, that moral issue. And that's why it was included in my definition. To achieve good, you must achieve good. Yeah. Great virtues. I love this. Ricardo, you've dropped so much wisdom here today. Uh, before we wrap it up, there's another point I just wanted to hit on. You talk about elevating your consciousness in your book, right? Yeah. So, and also, guys, grab the book. Greatness awaits you. You can order it online. You can go to Ricardo Bosi's website. What's your website address? I oh, know it's no longer available. The website go to Wilkinson Publishing. Go to yep. Wilkinson, yeah, Wilkinson Publishing, and uh, let Michael know you want a copy, and he'll get a copy to you. There you go. Or you can you can Google it too. I googled it and saw it pop up quite a few times. So awesome stuff. Uh, in your book, elevating your consciousness. Let's go into that. Okay, there are four steps. 
But the key one is, believe it or not, we've already covered it. It's living for somebody other than yourself. The step one, you live for yourself. You tend to live in fear. But then you, when you, the next step is to live for someone else. And that's, uh, the ex, that's experienced by a parent, a good parent. Not all parents are good, by the way. Some are bloody awful. But when you live for somebody else, somehow you seem to dig deeper and make sure that you, know, you, you feed your kids. And um, I've been in that situation, I alluded to it earlier, where money was very tight. And uh, while the kids ate well, uh, I'll tell you what, I was eating $2 a kilo apples. And that's uh, $4 a pound for my American friends. <laughs> so they weren't wow. quality apples. But I humble had the just, beginnings. <laughs> you've got to do what you've got to do. Uh, no, that wasn't the humble beginnings. That was, your life has sort of ups and downs. I'd be, I'd been fabulously successful and all of a sudden through, not through you know, corruption or anything bad, but you know, things just happen sometimes and there we are and I'm eating apples and the kids are, I'm doing my best to make decent schnitzels out of bad cuts of meat, but you know, plenty of flour and bed crumbs and I squeeze a lemon and they couldn't tell the difference. Um, but when you, when you live for your kids, when you live for somebody else, then uh, you, you can dig deeper. The next level of uh, raising your consciousness, the third level, is when you realize you are living for an ideal. Now, this is hard because a concept like free speech or liberty is easy for some people to grasp, but for a lot of people, it's not. They don't understand the foundational importance of liberty and free speech. But when you can get to that level and you are now living for an ideal, something greater than yourself and greater than just your human needs, now you're somewhere special. Um, but even that, eventually you run out of steam. You really run out of steam. Because uh, life's hard. It's a, it's a tough gig. Um, even when you do everything right, it just sometimes, sometimes it just all falls over. And then you've got to get to that fourth level. And that's when you realize you're living for God. Because you realize, and I certainly have, uh, every day is a gift from God. Because we have this, this cockeyed view that I worked for that. I got paid. Therefore, it's my car. Well, yes, it is. And you had to work and you had to pay for it. And it is your car. But everything can be taken from you in a moment. Everything. Mm -hmm. Your life. Yeah. Gone. Um, everything can be gone. And so what you realize, what I came to realize is that every moment, everything I have is a gift from God. And you can take it back when he wants. It's only on loan. <laughs> like I'm taking it with me. I heard that analogy the other day. U-Hauls. Uh, you don't see too many U-Hauls behind the hearse. It <laughs> yes, yes. It's an old saying, but it's a good one. Um, no, no. When, once you, if you want this elevated consciousness, if you want to be the greatest that you could possibly ever be, that's where you've got to get to. And you don't have to fight it. It'll come. Just listen. I'm a big uh, believer in intercessional prayer. Speaking to God works. In fact, I was cursing. And when I curse, that's just another way of praying, I think, sometimes. <laughs> As Mark Twain said, that cursing provides relief, even denied prayer. But anyway, I was in the kitchen and something had gone wrong and I was carrying on. And uh, I said, do I really have to put up with this? I said it to myself. And I could almost, heard, almost hear Jesus in the background going, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very humbling experience when you know your place. When you know your place. And that's that highest level. Now you're, you're working for God. You're working for the big man. He runs the show, and that's where that real elevated consciousness lives. Ravi Zachariah, um, even to the very end, he knew he was dying. He was concerned with the welfare of others. He wanted to make sure that every second, a less self-indulgent man you can't imagine. I mean, and if the listeners haven't listened to Ravi Zachariah, do yourself a big favor. Tune into any one of his countless videos. And up to his death, and it was just recently, and I cried. I, I genuinely did. I was moved. Yeah, uh, he was always concerned for the welfare of others. That was his life. And to bring people yeah. closer to God. And what, what greater gift can you possibly leave? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. He was a great mentor of mine too. I, I had um, thousands of questions. I was going through this struggling time with this, like, does God exist? And what does this all mean? And so many of my old belief systems that I had tried to implement over and over again to get results that I wanted in my life, no matter how much money I made and how big the business got and 
how many connections I had and celebrity I had in that experience, I still felt this emptiness in my heart. And uh, that fulfillment was found in the challenging of my belief system and worldviews to know that like, wow, there actually is a way. And Ravi was a huge catalyst for that through my, through the teaching I got from him. So yeah, if yeah, definitely check him out. I love that you're aligned with Ravi's work. Um, I, I see you having a very massive impact as well in the way that Ravi has in your own unique way. So Ricardo, love you, man. Really appreciate you being here with us today. Uh, if anybody here that's watching this or listening to this right now wants to follow you on social media, get behind your content, reach out to you, what would be the best way to do that? Oh, just, um, you can just Google me, the videos. Um, you can go to the website, Australia, AustraliaOneParty.com, AustraliaONEParty.com. That's the political side. The business side, uh, LionheartAustralasia.com lionheartaustralasia.com and you'll see the business side, um, leadership strategy and innovation are the three areas that I, I focus on. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It's great fun. So if you want to get in, in touch, please do. Yeah. You know, what I love too, man, is you're not, you're not out there trying to chase votes like typical, no. you know, political leaders. You're just like, if people are going to vote, they're going to vote. They're going to choose who they align with. Uh, so that to me really resonates. And then you're just leading with what's more important rather than trying to be popular in it, it's, it's going to come for sure. I already know that. I know uh, people that I am connected with in the space, big Australian influencers, uh, leaders in their own industries have also got behind you. They know who you are and they're very much big supporters of your message. Uh, so yeah, it'd be really interesting to see what happens over the next two years. We've got the elections coming up in a couple of years from now. And I am just really, really, really grateful for this conversation. I know the audience was taken through <laughs> another dimension. <laughs> so thank you for taking us there. I really appreciate it. I oh, know, Joel. Thank you. And uh, I'm very grateful and honored. And it's been a privilege to speak with you. And more yeah. power to your arm, mate. You're doing, you're doing God's work. So well done. Keep it up. Absolutely. Absolutely. So before we end this interview, this is the last question that we asked uh, every guest that has ever featured. And this question is, if you were to deliver your last 30 second speech to the world, what would that last 30 seconds sound like? Put God first. That's it. Once you do that, everything changes. You want to, you want to, you know, take it big, really big. Take that last final step, put God first. Your whole life changes. Your family changes. Everything changes. And finally you start to live that life that you were designed and created to live. 